Welcome everybody and welcome to um, those that may be joining us via YouTube as, as well. Um, and I can see that uh, we've got a few friends and, and guests um, uh, joining us as well. So you're, you're all very welcome. As I mentioned earlier, um, Les, um, Les Jones is un, uh, unable to be here um, this evening. He's, uh, he's uh, a little bit poorly at the moment, but uh, you know, recovering. So he's he's on the mend, but he does send his apologies. Otherwise, I'd normally sort of hand over to to Les to do the uh, the introductions. Um, but uh, as Les uh, isn't here uh, this evening, um, I just want to um, introduce our very special guest speaker, Professor John Zarnecki. And um, I don't want to steal too much of John's thunder because I know your talk is on spacecraft um i've known and loved and i think there's some uh, some great sort of little stories that are come going to come out of that but just by way of a, a brief introduction and i think many of you will know uh john perhaps from uh well you know various sort of prominent uh, tv um appearances and so on but john's had a um uh, a career now spanning well over 35 years in space research and notable roles in space exploration and in particular instrumentation um john mentioned whilst we were having our sort of chat a moment ago that um he he did used to work in the university of kent i think in fact that was probably one of your first academic posts because before that you were in british aerospace if i recall and um, yeah that's right john was there in the uh, in in the early 80s um and in fact um I, I i think i missed the opportunity to be one of your contemporaries because i had an offer at kent but uh, in the end i went to a city in london but uh, whilst john was there he was a project manager for an instrument that was carried on the european space agency probe uh, giotto which uh, analyzed dust from uh, Hay halley's comet uh, back in i think the mid the mid 80s now um and with the success of that mission, that, uh, no pun intended here, project proved to be a launch pad for John and, and his team uh, to develop instrumentation for ultimately the Huygens uh, probe and more of that um, later. And later on, John and part of that team decamped to the Open University at uh, Milton Keynes, where John has um, been sort of there working, I, I believe, as well as living. Uh, in in the area, John's received many honours, including uh, the most prestigious, uh, the greatest honour of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Gold Medal, uh, back in 2014. In fact, I think it's the uh, the highest award that the uh, uh, RAS can actually uh, confer. And then later, John became president of the Royal Astronomical Society in 2016, having been vice president beforehand, and. Now, John, I think when we first approached you, you were going to deliver your keynote speech uh, for us at our open day, which, of course, has long since <laughs> been, been, been sort of uh, had the kibosh put on it. So really pleased that you you're, uh, agreed to give your talk over WebEx. Um, but, you know, I know as a fervent Crystal Palace supporter, it was a little bit touch and go after the, uh, <laughs> the result last Friday. So I'm really glad that you've pulled yourself up and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, are here to, to give your talk. So without any further ado, John, the floor is yours. Spacecraft I've known and loved. Well, thank you very much, Les. Um, first of all, can you hear me OK? yeah good good um so uh it's it's great to to be here i you know like most of you i i'm regretting that we can't be meeting in person these are indeed strange times uh, so this is only the second i've attended loads of uh zoom and webexes but i've only once actually given a talk uh on uh as the presenter, so it's a bit of an experiment for, for me, but uh, hopefully it will go okay. Les seems to know what he's doing. Um, so what I'm going to do is is take a bit of a random walk through uh, some of the projects that I'm involved with, and um, also use these 
uh, to illustrate in some ways some of the different ways of doing space science because I've been fortunate enough to be associated with quite a different types of, of space mission. Space mission. Um, before launching into those, I should just tell you um, that despite my name, which doesn't sound very English, I am indeed, I'm London born and bred, and uh, I grew up in North London in N3. Um, I, I don't have any obvious connections with Havering, so I, I did check out that my third cousins lived in Chadwell Heath, which I think is not a million miles away. That's my closest connection as far as I can see. Anyway, enough of that. Um, I should now share the slides. So just bear with Push share. There we go. Is anything happening? Ah. Yep, we're getting the message. Well, yeah. and uh, I'm trying John, to go into. You, there we go. Did you select the um, optimize for video app? Might be worth just. Spletive. Uh, um, <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I think. How do I go back? If you stop sharing. Right, hang on a second. Okay, stop sharing. I've just pushed that button. So I go to share again and I look for I look for that button. It's in the top left hand corner. Click optimize, optimize for. I optimize motion, motion and video. Is that right? Perfect. Yes. And. All right, this, folks, we are getting there. So it should appear. Yep, it's on screen. Thanks. Message just one said because of your poor network performance, your content is shared at a lower resolution, which may make it difficult for users to read text. It's too bad, and we can switch to you, Les. Okay. Okay, it's looking good so far. Oh, so, um, well, when I when I was born and was a, a, a small child, um, the only sort of involvement with space that one had was was through, in my case comic books and uh, Dan Dare, the Eagle comic and things like that, because, of course, the uh, space age had started. And in fact, if I'd listened to my elders and betters, I, I wouldn't have thought about a career in space. Space travel is utter bilge. That. Perfect. Is what the astronomer royal Sir Richard Woolley said uh, infamously in 1956, or people say that he was misquoted, and of course rather live to regret that because just a year later, uh, some of you will know what happened, and and that was this. So, of course, that is Sputnik 1, launched in October 1957, uh, just about the size of a large beach ball, just about two feet across, and it was in orbit, 96-minute orbit for uh, something like three weeks. And I remember that. I remember hearing that on the radio, on the news, 
uh, because, of course, like most people, we didn't have a television then. Um, but uh, it was on the news, and I remember I was about six years old, and uh, it really, I mean, it was was incredible. It was hard to believe that there was a man-made object orbiting a few hundred kilometers above our heads, and that was truly the start of the space age. And I do, I do remember that quite well, and and really sort of taking notice of it. And then, of course, just a few years later something even more amazing happened, 1961, April 61, when this handsome young man, Yuri Gagarin, uh, performed one orbit of the Earth, 108 minutes, and arguably he became the most famous person on the Earth. Uh, he, was, he was handsome, he was charismatic, and uh, as I say, he became a, a, a bit of a star. And it's hard to understand, I think, if you weren't uh, alive then to realise what an impact this had. Because, you know, up till then, any, any idea of space travel was, was truly science fiction. And suddenly it had become uh, fact. I don't know if there's anybody old enough like me to remember uh, that, uh, that event. And as I said, he became very famous, became a, a superstar. And of course, this was also the height of the Cold War. So it, it, the Soviet Union were not going to waste this opportunity. And just a few months after his flight, he undertook a essentially a world tour. And I, I think the UK was the first place he came to. And uh, in those days, if a visiting Soviet dignitary came to London, it actually was his second port of call in Britain. He first went to Manchester, but it was compulsory to go. Uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes. Uh, can you see the cursor, Les? Yes, yes, it is moving. It's three famous people in this picture. Here, this is Karl Marx. Uh, the, the, the founder of, of, of communism, I guess. And this is his um, uh, memorial in Highgate Cemetery in North London. And uh, there is Yuri Gagarin saluting in front of uh, the bust of Karl Marx. And there in the red circle, just behind this policeman, you can see that forehead there. Well, that, that's me, honest. Um, I was at school just uh, a few hundred yards away from Highgate Cemetery, and we were given uh, the, the afternoon off school because of this event. And I guess most of my friends didn't take too much notice, but a, a group of us decided we, we want to go and see this fellow. And uh, so uh, that, that's how I ended up there. And it, it was, it, I, I like to call it my eureka moment. Um, I was standing there just a few feet away from Gagarin, and it really did make an impact on me. Um, and so now he's, he was a small man. It's one of the requirements to fit in the capsule. I think he was five feet two inches tall. Um, but uh, I, I, was, I was really impressed, and I decided, though I didn't really know anything about what, what it would be, what it would meant, but I decided that if at all possible, I wanted to have something to do with space. So I, uh, I suppose, in direction. I, I was interested in maths and science. I, uh, I uh, did my exams, and I went to. I studied physics at Cambridge, and uh, I then went. To do a PhD, I got accepted at University College London uh, to do a PhD. And the reason I went there was that they were advertising for people to get involved with rockets, uh, building instruments to go on sounding rockets and launching them from the Woomera rocket range in Australia. Um, so this is me. I think this is about 1971, 70 
This was the first foreign conference I went to in Paris. And, uh, you know, this was a lot. It looked like John Lennon with the hair and the glasses. Um, yeah, I enjoyed life, but uh, I was doing something which was incredibly exciting. And it was working on these rockets that I said was what attracted me to going to UCL. So this this is a Skylark sounding rocket. So sounding rockets were developed starting in the very late 50s uh, in several countries, the US, Soviet Union, France, Canada, the UK. And initially, their purpose was to sound the upper atmosphere, to make measurements of the atmosphere. What was its structure? How did it work? And so on. Uh, in 1962, one of these rockets was in the US was uh, instrumented with X-ray detectors. They um, and they discovered, by, to, to everybody's surprise, a source of X-rays from uh, in the direction of, of the center of our galaxy, a source that we subsequently knew as SCO X1, Scorpius X1, and this was really the start of um, astronomy, let's say, of rocket or space age astronomy. Um, and I idealized, but what I want to uh, use it to illustrate is what we've got along the bottom is, no, let's look along the top. So we've got the electromagnetic spectrum going from radio waves, shorter and shorter wavelengths to UV, X and gamma rays. And up here is altitude above the Earth's surface. And this this white line here tells you at what height in the atmosphere most of that radiation is absorbed at. So let's take the middle of the X-ray band. So medium energy X-rays, well, they are, most of them are ex absorbed by 100 kilometers above the surface. So that means that essentially nothing at that energy gets to the surface. So you can see ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays are all absorbed high in the atmosphere. The same is true for pretty much most of the infrared and the microwave. So the only radiation that gets to the surface essentially is the visible, which is why you can see stars in the sky, and uh, most of the radio spectrum. So what means of is that most radiation from the cosmos, from stars, galaxies, from whatever, is, is blocked to us. I'm sure most people are aware of that. We're only looking at a tiny part of the entire gamut of radiation that is emitted. And so as astronomers, I mean, that's, that's a bad thing because we, you know, we're only seeing a tiny part of information that is available. As human beings, it's actually rather a good thing because, of course, radiation, particularly the high energy, is, is rather uh, damaging to us. So with the, 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 the start of the space age, what this meant was that if we could put detectors on rockets or satellites and go above the atmosphere, we could start observing the universe in these parts of the spectrum which uh, were inaccessible to us up till then. And of course, these told us so much more, or had the potential to tell us so much more than the narrow parts of the spectrum that we'd essentially used as, extra as astronomers for, for, for centuries or even millennia. So that was the start of space astronomy. And that's what I was um, uh, lucky enough to be involved with uh, at at university college. Now, in particular, one I said that the first X-ray source discovered was Scorpius X1, which we now know is an accretion disk around a compact object, probably a black hole. But very soon, within the the following years, there were probably a couple of hundred X-ray sources discovered, 
And it seemed that one category of X-ray object was associated with supernova remnants. So objects so supernovae, but not the supernovae, but the remnants, the, the material that's left over thousands of years after the explosion. And this is one example. This is the Cygnus loop. And what with, with a little bit of imagination, you could imagine that there was an explosion of a star here, approximate center, and then over the subsequent years, the shock wave from that. Uh, explosion plows out through the interstellar medium and creates a shell of sh sh shock heated material and it's this which glows in the in the in the optical part of the spectrum but as i say there were several of these but there was no certainty as to what it was that was producing the radiation there were two theories one was that it was shock heated gas so basically very very hot gas that was glowing in extra well the other possibility was that it was very energetic electrons which would go up supernova explosion and these can produce a radiation called synchrotron radiation uh well astronomy had seen uh, because radio astronomy had been going probably since well, since just before the war, and quite a few supernova remnants had been observed as radio sources, but it was these energetic electrons that were producing the radio waves. So what was it that was producing the X-rays? Well, pretty much the only way to find out then was to look at the spectrum, because if it was hot gas, you'd produce a spectrum with sharp spectral lines you know lines like uh, sodium street lamps look they do because of their spectrum there they produce these yellow uh, sodium uh, lines in in the spectrum whereas if it was the synchrotron emission you would see a smooth a continuous uh, a spectrum in the x-ray so i was given the task uh, mere stripling of 22 years old um to build design and build with the engineers at ucl a rocket payload here it is here you can see the rocket body here at the bottom and this is an x-ray detector and this is a plate which carries a set of crystals x-ray reflecting crystals now, the trouble is that these X-ray detectors then didn't have any or any significant wavelength or energy resolution. What that means is they couldn't tell the difference between, it was in the visible, they couldn't tell the difference between yellow or red light. It was all just sort of merged together. But by putting this crystal in front, scanning it backwards and forwards, about the axis here changing the angle of incidence you and through the spectrum so the plan was to launch this point it at the strongest source of soft x-rays which was in the direction of puppies a the, the southern constellation which uh was this strong source of X-rays and appeared to be associated with a supernova remnant. And so a flight, which would last only a matter of minutes, as long as the payload locked on to the star, uh, to the right star, which was uh, adjacent to the supernova remnant, and then the X-rays would come down, would hit this plate and be reflected into the detector. See that. So what happened? Well, it it remarkably worked. It was uh, it was I, I can't tell you how it was to, to be. You know, in my early twenties, I was working with an electronics engineer and a detector engineer who were both my age. We were, you know, this was our first project. We had a, a mechanical engineer. Who did much of the mechanical design 
who we thought was incredibly old, and I think he'd had six years' experience of space research in his late 30s. So what happened? Well, I love graphs. And so this is essentially the output of that uh, rocket. Right? This is li it's literally three minutes worth of data. And so there were five scans through the spectrum. And this is uh, my hand-drawn spectrum. There was I think, no fancy software plotting packages then. So this is essentially intensity of x-rays against energy or wavelength. And the critical bit was this peak here. You know, not very impressive, but it does seem higher than the surrounding uh, bins, as we call them. And in fact, that I suggested was the emission line of oxygen-8, highly ionized oxygen, which is only produced at a temperature of 2 million degrees. And so I published this and I said, this proves that what is producing the x-rays is shock heated gas, with hot gas that is the source of x-rays in supernova remnants. In fact, a few years later, that was confirmed when with a, um, was able to at that source for several hours and produce a much more sensitive spectrum. So that's a little bit about sounding rockets. Sounding rockets were fantastic in the early days of uh, space astronomy, um, but they were fairly quickly superseded by satellites, which are much more expensive and more complicated, gave you in principle you know, several years of observation and any one source you could look at for several hours rather than just a few minutes. And in fact, after I finished that project, wrote my PhD, we at uh, UCL, we got involved with uh, an early X-ray astronomy satellite. And here it is. Um, this is... So this is just before the satellite, which was called, you can see it there, UK-6. So it was the last in the series of British-built scientific satellites. And it was launched on a Scout, a US Scout vehicle. It was the 100th launch of the Scout. And it does make me laugh seeing this picture. Health and safety didn't exist then as it does now. I mean, literally, the, this was just before the rocket launching the satellite was pivoted upwards at the launch uh, at the launch tower so there we were standing by the rocket it was of course a solid rocket motor which is is very stable and relatively safe but look no hard hats no uh, obvious uh, uh, protective clothing and uh, somewhere there that's a, a younger version of me part of the team of academics and engineers um, uh, before the launch of that satellite. So that was launched 1978. It was, we were one of three experiments, astronomy experiments. It was not super successful. It had technical difficulties, but we made some observations, published uh, some papers, and uh, it was, for me anyway, it was my first um, uh, directly with the design development of satellite instrumentation. And this, again, as I said before, in X-ray astronomy, um, it had to be above the atmosphere uh, in order to observe anything, because the X-rays are absorbed in the atmosphere. Interesting looking at that photograph from my uh, uh, al personal album. It, one thing that strikes you is that everybody there is male. Um, the, it was a male-dominated uh, uh, scientific world at the time. And things have very much changed now. Uh, just as an aside, I thought I would mention this. Um, around that time, uh, 
European Space Agency, through the member states, including the UK, were looking for the first European astronaut to fly on the space shuttle to uh, the space lab uh, orbiting uh, laboratory. And I, and I applied for that. And in fact, I got down to the last 30 candidates in the UK. I went as far as medical and psychological testing. And uh, this is the letter that I've got, my rejection letter. I'm sorry to say that your name is not one of those which has been put forward. Um, that was the closest I ever got. I've actually applied to be an astronaut three times, failed three times. And I suspect there isn't another person in the UK who can say that they are three times failed astronaut. But at least I got as far as uh, the, the testing uh, for that. So after UK six, jobs were incredibly difficult to come by in the universities because of the recession at the time. And I got, uh, uh, I, not sidetracked, I moved to Bristol. Um, not to work on the SS Great Britain or because of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Wonderful, though, they, they both are. Bristol is a wonderful place. But to work on this project called Large Space Telescope. Now, I wonder if anybody recognises it. I suspect some people will, because though I started working on the Large Space Telescope, while I was working on it, it changed its name. It became the Hubble Space Telescope. How many people realize that actually Hubble is thought of generally as a US project? It actually, from the very beginning, it has had 20% uh, European involvement. And uh, so through ESA, European Space Agency, uh, mostly Germany and the UK were involved in building one of the five scientific instruments at the focus of the telescope. And so I went to British Aerospace in Bristol, who had a very big contract to develop the parts of the faint object camera. And uh, that was, I worked on that for three years, I left before it was launched. Um, Many of you will probably remember that uh, which to launch it wasn't too successful. I love this cartoon, which says, all right, which bloody fool left the lens cap on? That wasn't quite the problem. You might remember it was the, the shape, the figure of the mirror, which wasn't quite right. But of course, that was uh, remarkably, it was fixed. And uh, just as first images, from the faint object camera. And you can see here, this is a, a, just a, a two stars separated by just under three arc seconds. And you can compare that with a ground-based image of the same stars. And this is an example, you might say, well, why bother with Hubble? Because we can see uh, visible light from the telescopes on the ground. But just because of the seeing, the atmospheric blurring of uh, sources of light uh, by the atmosphere. Just look at the difference. You can see the blurring of images uh, with what we see without the blurring of uh, the UK by going to space. And in fact, this is a very early image. Uh, later ones produced even sharper, crisper images. And that enables an enormous step forward uh, what you can achieve. The faint object camera at the time was the most sensitive camera ever launched and it operated for 12 years, which uh, might still be a record for the length of time of a camera in space. So I worked on that, but I was then sort of uh, seduced away by this object or similar object by a comet. Um, I, Halley's Comet. And at this time, this was the early 80s, ESA had uh, taken the decision to a very ambitious project, Giotto, 
that Les mentioned. So this was ESA's first interplanetary mission. Uh, I was so, um, I thought this was fantastic. And I saw an opportunity to go to University of Kent to be the project manager for building a dust detection instrument to measure the dust around the comet. And uh, I indeed got that. So I moved to the University of Kent. And uh, and also this was for me a big change because up till then I'd been I'd been an astro a traditional astronomer. Well, maybe not so traditional, but I, I was an astronomer. And now I was moving to solar system research. And this then is uh, there's the Giotto spacecraft, quite modest in size, but very ambitious. And there's a again a younger me in the middle with some of my colleagues from the University of Kent. And that was launched in eighty five and arrived March eighty six. Uh, absolutely fantastic and. This is one of the first images we got from the camera. And you realize up to that time, nobody had ever seen the nucleus of a comet. We had actually no idea if there would even be a solid object. And this is what we saw. Tiny object, of course, astronomically. That's something like 15 kilometers the longest dimension, with the sun shining on one side gas and dust streaming off, and you even get an idea of the topography. Here's a terminator, a hill sticking up, catching the sunlight on the dark side. And we measured with our instrument, we measured the dust streaming off the comet. 30,000 impacts we detected, and we were able to, to map uh, the dust uh, around. So this was then, of course, for me, a, a different type of mission, and it illustrates very well um, the fact that if you're interested in solar system, the space age gave us the possibility actually to go to the object. Um, so in astronomy, there's no possibility yet to go and look at other stars or, or, or galaxies. With the solar system, we can pretty much go to, uh, you know, we've now visited the outermost planets. So in, in principle, we can visit and make measurements of any object uh, in, the, in the solar system. Now, around this time, I also, uh, let's say traditional astronomy. This, this is a bit of a setup, really. This is at the um, Barcelona Observatory. I wasn't really observing. That's just a photo opportunity. Around that time, uh, with my interest in comets, I went to, I got telescope time in Hawaii, Australia, in South Africa, and in Chile. So for, for a period of 10 years, I actually did visit some wonderful observatories and was involved in, in essentially looking at the coma, the, the, the dust uh, around comets. So that was also uh, something that I did at that time. Um, right now, moving on, and I need to speed up a little bit. Um, the project that I suppose took up the the largest part of my career, fifth, more than fifteen years, and this was the project to go to and study for the first time in detail the Saturnian system. You, you can see in this uh, composite. You know, what a complex place it is with Saturn, the gas giant, the array of satellites around it, the incredibly complex ring uh, system around it, and, and Francis, the magnetosphere, the, the sort of magnetic bubble around Saturn. So East and NASA got together in I think 89 and came up with the very ambitious aim to send a satellite for the first time to go into orbit in the Saturn. Before that, we'd only flown past Saturn 
And so this was Cassini Huygens, so the large Cassini spacecraft. Uh, this this whole thing was something like six tons at launch. But still, the most massive spacecraft ever launched to the outer solar system, and carrying the Huygens probe. So this was the European contribution. Uh, this was the, the NASA spacecraft, and so the aim was to study the whole of the system, but especially the Huygens probe was going to uh, was attached and aim to descend uh, into Titan's atmosphere and, and, and study it. I should say that Titan had been observed by the Voyager spacecraft on their way through, and they had shown that Titan is really uh, unique in the solar system it's the only satellite with an atmosphere. It's a very thick atmosphere. It's covered with this permanent orange smog and haze. No sight directly of the surface, but there were indirect evidence that it might be a liquid covered surface, not water, but liquid methane and ethane. Uh, it's much too cold, minus 180 degrees, much too cold for liquid water, but an absolutely it looked like an absolutely fascinating place. So that's why the Huygens probe was going to study just that one uh, satellite. And I got involved with that. In fact, uh, at Institute Kent, I put a team together and we put in a proposal for an instrument and we were selected. From 1990, uh, that's what the focus of my uh, work was. Um, I could go on for hours about Cassini Huygens. I won't, but let me just say some landing scenarios. As I said, Titan was totally covered by haze. So though Voyager took uh, something like a thousand pictures of it as it flew past, not a single direct picture of what was on the surface. But there were essentially three possibilities we believe. One is that so this is the Huygens probe uh, sitting on a what well, looks like a sort of Mediter gentle Mediterranean sea lapping uh, a shore line. That was one possibility. The other was that the surface of Titan was covered by goo or gunge of uh, hydrocarbons. Sort of think of it as tar or oil. We knew the, there was evidence that the atmosphere was very relaxed and that there was stuff that was falling down onto the surface, giving it this uh, oily, tarry covering. Or the third possibility was because we knew the Titan was essentially uh, an icy body with a rocky core, we could land on a hard, icy surface. And we had no idea which of these uh, we would find and that's the reason why Huygens was always designed as an atmospheric probe. Um, the plan, we were always told that survival on the surface would be, would be um, a bonus. And in fact, the ESA uh, made us a minute survival maximum on the surface. This is the mission um, to get to get a, a, a large spacecraft with a complement of instruments, we with conventional technology couldn't go straight there. So we had to do what is commonly done done now: use gravity assist. So we had after launch in October '97, we had two flybys of Venus, one of Earth, the one which gave the biggest delta V ch change of, of velocity was at Jupiter. And we arrived at the Saturnian system in 2004. And then in Christmas Day 2004, Huygens was separated uh, from Cassini with a three week, uh, we put on a, a, a three week collision course to Titan. So now what I'm going to do is show a couple of video clips. These are from the BBC called Destination Titan, which 
some of you might have seen. So each, so this is the first two minutes or so, and the last two minutes of that program. Okay, and I hope that that you will work. So here goes. So this is the first two minutes. January the 14th, 2005. The day had finally arrived, the day that I'd thought about every day for 17 years. A billion and a half miles away, out there, there was something that we'd built. And it was hurtling through space at 20,000 miles an hour. Would it do just what we designed it to do? or would it all be wasted? We went into the, the science room that morning knowing that whatever was going to happen was going to happen. I mean, this was the day. There was an enormous air of expectation. Basically everyone I met was as excited but also as nervous as I was about the whole mission. I think we were all petrified. But the very worst thing that shouldn't have happened, happened. It turned out that there was a, a major problem. I just wanted to go away and cry in a corner. That really ramped up the, the nerves. You know, there's a missing command, what else is wrong? I really have now of the last 17 years having been wasted. So I hope that came through loud and clear. So I'm now going to show the last couple of minutes from that program, which includes the descent. And uh, you, you might see, in, I think, the bottom right-hand corner, there's some, some numbers which show the speed and altitude above the surface of Titan. I would just say that the probe, as it was descending, was spinning and also being blown by the wind. So what you see the images that you see, they've all been cleaned out to take away the rotation and the buffeting by the wind. So here goes. There was barely a single day since the project had started when I hadn't tried to imagine what the surface of Titan looked like. It's 60 kilometers above the surface, 50, coming down through the haze, the clouds, getting to see the surface. I remember the first kilometers an hour. That we saw were quite remarkable. We saw this landscape carved with what looked like river channels. The theory there had been liquid on the surface of Titan was true. It was absolutely amazing to see it, the first people to see that image. Also, it struck me that it looks so much like Earth. It looked like Arizona, it looked like the French Riviera, it looked familiar. And that wasn't something I think we were expecting. And then we saw the landing image, the area immediately around the probe. It was an area that seemed to be stripped. And it, I just couldn't believe that our probe that we, of course, knew so well and, and my beloved instruments on board it were actually sitting quietly, serenely, on this surface environment.
seen that many times. I always feel quite emotional when I see it. You know, it, that was the culmination of, of 15 years of work. And that, that one surface image, if that was all we'd got from the project, I would say it would have been worthwhile. Anyway, just to recapitulate, so what happened, we descended under three parachutes as planned, two hours, 28 minutes, which was, was longer than we thought to get to the surface. We survived the landing. It was actually quite gentle. And we survived on the surface for 72 minutes. In fact, we had probably survived longer, but the link back to the Earth, which was via Cassini, which was flying overhead, Cassini essentially disappeared over the horizon. And from the from the data, we reckoned that there was another 10 or 20 minutes of battery lifetime uh, before the, uh, the, the probe would have run out of power. So um, here then, uh, these are the original raw images from the camera of the surface. And uh, of course, they exist in cleaned up versions. But I love these original ones. And here you can see the river systems, absolutely beautiful. And what was a, had been a shoreline along there, this was in fact a dried up lake. And here lower down from about eight kilometers, looking sideways, and you can see these, these river channels, absolutely remarkable. And that's then surface image. And uh, so the camera is about six inches above the ground. The horizon's about 500 meters away. It's gently undulating. And these look like these are smooth pebbles. You can see quite rounded. And here, can you see the material underneath has been uh, washed away, uh, further supporting the idea that there had been liquid. This is the sort of thing you'd see on a riverbed uh, or, or a lake shore uh, on the Earth. Quite quite remarkable. So my instrument was the surface science package. So it was nine little sensors that were designed, as the name implies, to make measurements of the surface properties. No, any of them, except I'll just mention one. We had what was essentially an instrumented stick there, seen here again, that was sticking out of the front of the probe. And we, it, the plan was that in case we didn't see the smog, and if the probe was smashed on landing, this, as it pushed into the surface, would tell us something about the physical nature of the surface. And that's exactly what it did. From here, I hope you can see, that's when 300 kilograms of Huygens smashed into the surface. But for this time, that 15 milliseconds, 15 thousandths of a second, ours was the only thing touching the surface of Titan. And my student, Carl Atkinson, wrote a very good PhD analyzing 15 thousandths of a second of data. And he, he wrote a, a detailed expose of the nature of two centimeters of the surface of Titan. That's, uh, uh, remember, Titan has a surface area of 80 million kilometers. So this was only a tiny one. But uh, basically, he, he said, and I uh, absolutely agree, that what we are seeing is Titan's equivalent of sand or gravel produced as on Earth by the action of water on rock. On Titan, it was the action of, of liquid methane on on an icy surface. Okay, I've got a few more slides left, so I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Yeah, we, we, we made some headlines around the world because it was actually a quiet weekend for news. And at the press conference, um, we had to do just a few hours of the landing. I was asked what the surface was like, and for various reasons, I described it as creme brulee because we thought there was a sort of crust on the surface. And that the creme brulee went round the world. And I'm still teased by colleagues sometimes about the creme brulee. OK, let me move very quickly through the last few slides. Um, Zeta, 
So uh, this is a project I was involved with. In fact, I helped organize the kickoff meeting for that project in 1986. Uh, and that, I, I say that to show how long these projects take to come to fruition, because the landing on uh, Comet CG was about five years ago. So many, many years in the gestation, but I uh, had a small involvement then in some of the instruments that eventually produced fantastic data from the surface of a comet. What I would just also in passing, I don't know if you've had him as a speaker, but the project scientist for um, Rosetta Taylor, or was Matt Taylor, who comes, I think, from just a few miles from, from Havering. So if you haven't had him as a speaker, I suggest you do, because he's, he's almost a local uh, to you. Um, of course, pro space projects don't always work. Beagle 2, you probably remember, uh, artist impression here. So I developed uh, with my team one of the instruments. And as we now know, it landed on the surface of Mars. But these petals carrying the uh, solar panels, they didn't all deploy, which meant that we were never able to communicate with it. And this is. Uh, just for those interested in the technology, the sort of very small, simple sensors we developed to measure the um, the, the weather on the surface of Mars. These, this package weighed less than that was a real challenge on Beagle, the miniaturization. Okay, um, a lot of what we do in space research involves making proposals. Uh, for future missions. So this is one of the more interesting ones I was involved with. So this is the Cassini Huygens. This was a mission tandem, Titan and Enceladus mission. And this I love this artist's impression. It's not scientifically terribly accurate, but it shows what we were proposing. So this up here, rather low altitude, is an orbiter. Uh, Titan, because of its thick atmosphere, is a great place to deploy uh, an aerial vehicle. So, uh, um, on Golfier, that's not quite what we were proposing, but it looks nice. And then we were also proposing to put down small, dedicated uh, landers in places which the aerial platform identified as being especially interesting. So that. Um, a proposal to ESA, and it did very well, but it actually lost out to a proposal called JUICE, uh, Jupiter, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, which is actually being built at, at the present time. That's going to end up in orbit around Ganymede. Uh, there's another one which nearly succeeded, but didn't. This one is um, a proposal to NASA, and this was to put into the lakes or rather the sea the biggest sea on titan we uh, didn't talk about it but cassini identified uh, a 400,000 square kilometer sea on titan and uh, this uh, nearly succeeded it lost out to a mars mission called insight which is currently sitting on the surface of mars measuring mars quakes um, finish off with a proposal which actually I am not involved with because it's too far into the future but it was developed by Ralph Lorenz who you saw uh, speaking on the video clips he was actually my student and the project is actually led by his wife uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, Turtle uh, they both work in in the states at Johns Hopkins University and this is an incredible mission it's, it's uh, beaten all the competition and NASA are going to fly it. And the proposal is to send a, uh, a drone or an aerobot to Titan. And once on Titan, it is then going to um, carry out a mission traveling tens to hundreds of kilometers looking at interesting places on Titan and fully instrumented uh, 
Uh, here you can see some further details. Launch in 25, arrival in 2034. It should last for two years and it will it will fly on batteries which will be recharged by RTG to essentially nuclear power sources uh, during Titan's nights. So this is, I mean, I think of how we've come from Sputnik 1 to this uh, in one lifetime. Uh, absolutely staggering, isn't it? One can hardly believe what will happen over the next uh, lifetime in terms of space research. So just, I think now my final couple of slides, I've done, I've been so fortunate and lucky to be involved with so many exciting missions and they're one of the that I haven't mentioned. But I've also done which I would never have expected. So you might recognize, well, that's a quarter scale model of the Huygens probe at the bottom and myself talking to Tony Blair um, came to Milton Keynes. It was just before the general election and the fact that Milton Keynes was a marginal constituency, I suspect was the reason for his visit rather than an interest in planetary science. But uh, it was an interesting meeting, I must say. I also very fortunate I had a two minute meeting with Neil Armstrong a couple of years before he died. And that I have to say it was quite something. Um, and finally, fortunate to have had an asteroid named after me, asteroid 17,920, which thankfully is not an Earth crossing asteroid, so no danger, at least uh, at the moment, that it's going to impact the Earth. But, uh, that was a lovely uh, surprise. So um, that's it. I'm sorry if I've gone on a few minutes too long. Um, I can only see two people and they haven't fallen asleep. So uh, um, I hope that was of some interest and um, thank you for your attention. To anybody. Yes, no, absolutely. Br brilliant, uh, John. Thank you very much. And I'm going to unmute everybody and invite everybody to show their appreciation in the uh, in the usual way. So hopefully, are you all unmuted? Yeah. So, thanks very much, John. And I'm unfortunately, given, given my the... my. Sorry, John. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you for, for attending. And, uh, you know, I guess we're all getting used to this as the new normal. Yeah. And uh, and the, the, the technology worked, didn't it? It did indeed. Everything came through loud and clear and the, the bandwidth uh, <laughs> sort of he held out. So uh, we're, we're fortunate. Uh, thanks to uh, all those invisible um well, I don't know what they are in in in, in the cloud somewhere. But, uh, we're, we're here, and um, yeah, th thanks very much again, John. Um, are you able to uh, um, stay for a few questions? There have been a few coming through on on the chat. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Well, um, okay. Let's just go down the uh, the list. Um, so I think early on in your talk, you 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 showed that graph of um, like the spectrum graph, and you were talking about uh, X rays. Uh, so the first question is, what what type of X rays are in uh, in the centre of our galaxy, or I guess emanating from the centre of our galaxy? Well, from the centre of the galaxy, that's. OX1, Scorpius X1, which is, is one of the strongest X-ray sources. So that is from, and, and please remember, I haven't been an X-ray astronomer for about 30 years, but um, it is an accretion disk around a black hole. So, um, you know, I'm sure most people know that black hole sucks material in, produces this disk of infalling material which is incredibly hot, and uh, and it's 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 that which then produces the X rays. 
and and that's I think one of the ways in which people study uh, black hole directly by by observing the, the accretion disk as it's called around um, around the black hole. The discoverer, the person who did that, made that observation was Riccardo Giacconi, and and he won the Nobel Prize. Um, for that discovery of the first um, cosmic rays. We'd known that the sun was a source of X-rays. And in fact, my supervisor, the supervisor, Len Culhane, said that he'd nearly made that discovery. He had a rocket flight that was uh, looking uh, at the sun, but in traversing across the sky to observe the sun, his detector just missed uh, where Sc SCO X1 was on the sky. So if things have been different, I might have been working for a Nobel Prize winner. Anyway. Excellent. I, I think that actually links on to the next uh, question. Did you detect any X rays from uh, um, active galactic uh, <coughs> nuclear or uh, quasars? Um, well, actually, I, did, I didn't talk about this, but um, I, we did have access when I was working on the rocket flight. There was the X-ray instruments on a satellite before the UK-6, which I showed you. So um, the head of our laboratory, Professor Robert Boyd, had managed to get a, a small X-ray uh, telescope on an American satellite, which had a big ultraviolet telescope. And so I was involved in analyzing data from that. And I think the very first paper I wrote with colleagues looking at NGC 1275, which is the Perseus cluster. So that's the... the I think that's the only extra galactic astronomy I did, uh, Perseus cluster. So not quasars or AGNs, but uh, a, a, a cluster of galaxies. So no, my my career has from you know has gone from out there to to here in the solar system. So my my horizon is really at the edge of the solar system. Although I suppose now with exoplanets uh, that that that. I, connection out there brilliant brilliant okay uh, you mentioned space lab and your your sort of application and then then the two other sort of subsequent ones what was the selection process like um and uh who who was or were the successful candidates so uh, any, anybody you were sort of familiar with at the time um well for the first one for the for the space lab well, the way it worked then was that each ESA member did their own selection, and I think every country put in six, five or six candidates to ESA, who then, you know, took over. So I, the, the UK had a, came down to 30, so I got down to the last 30, which I was quite chuffed about, and through medical testing, which was done by the RAF. And we went through psychological testing, which was a bit weird. But I was told that I got knocked out because of my eyesight. So I wear contact lenses. And um, in those days, you had to be, you know, 2020 vision, really, and all that. And But it, I, it's, it is amusing because I've met several who wear, you know, pebble glasses, really, glasses with really thick lenses. So these days, it's it's not an issue. But I think, uh, I can't remember who's, uh, of them was a military person, but I think the person who flew, it was, uh, was it Ulf Meerbolt? Was he German or Swiss? And I can't remember. The second time I applied was for the, um, the Helen Sharman flight. I'm sure most people know the first, British astronaut was Helen Sharma. And uh, I think there were 30,000 applications. I got nowhere with that. 
rejection letter. And then the third time, this was tongue in cheek, really, was the Tim Peake selection. And they couldn't, because of discrimination laws, they couldn't uh, specify an upper age limit. Uh, but they did say was preferred age range. I remember this very well, because it was odd, 27 to 37. And I was 57 when I applied. So I, I was pretty sure that being 20 years above the uh, preferred age range meant I wasn't going to get very far. Anyway, so that's, that's, oh, having said all of that, well, um, I've been in the Vomit Comet, if, if people know what that is. That's the plane which goes up and dives and you get 23 seconds of zero gravity. So I, that, that, it was an ESA Airbus over the Bay of Biscay. So I've done 32 parabolas and I can tell you it is bloody marvellous. <laughs> Absolutely great. Yeah, recommend if anybody gets the chance to do that, go for it. It's excellent. I was, I mean, it is serious. It wasn't just that, it's not done for people just to out and have fun. There were 20 experiment teams, you know, running experiments. I managed to blag my way in as a support member of one of the teams. <laughs> it, it sounds like that, that's a sort of a qualification for. Uh getting uh, on successful missions and so on is the ability to blag well then. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, mean that, I mean that in a nice you, possible way, by the way. <laughs> you've seen through me. You've seen through me, yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think that's true in most parts of life, isn't it? You've you got to sometimes get to blagging. Indeed. Um, on to the next question, if, if you're still okay for a, a few more questions, uh, John. We've had a few in. Sure, no um, problem. There was the, the, I think it was the faint object um, camera that you uh, uh, helped develop. Um, and the question here is, have uh, adaption... It's in the Science Museum, I think. The, the engineering model of it is in the Science Museum. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. Um, have adaptive optics largely replaced the need for space telescopes like Hubble in the visible region? That, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that. Adaptive optics, of course, I mean, is, is pretty much close to magic, isn't it? But my understanding is that though you can do a lot with adaptive optics, um, you, not, you need relatively bright sources to be able to do uh, apply adaptive optics. Um, so it's not a panacea for everything and there is still a benefit uh to get to going above the earth's atmosphere but yeah adaptive optics does does really work wonders yeah. mm. i know i know there's a few of us that uh, indulge in um, astro imaging and uh, some have been look, dabbling in planetary and there's a sort of a technique called lucky lucky imaging which is you know <laughs> Sort of taking thousands of frames and then hoping that uh, the software will uh, will sort it all out. So I guess uh, I guess that's another way around it. Um, next uh, next question: uh, What causes the magnetosphere around uh, Saturn? I think we mentioned that earlier on. It is. It's the interaction. It's like it's like at Earth. I mean, we have a magnetosphere. It's the action of the intrinsic magnetic field of the object, i.e. Saturn in that case, and the magnetic field of the sun, which you can think of as sort of streaming out from the sun, and the 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 solar wind, the particles which stream out from the sun. So this produces this very complex magnetic structure um, uh, uh, around Saturn. And I think it's true, it, it, is it not that, am I thinking of Jupiter here, that either it's either Saturn or Jupiter's magnetosphere, which is, uh, is sometimes described as the largest structure in the solar system. Um, it, 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 it is very big. Um, and uh, you know, for people who get excited 
by magnetic fields myself sometimes don't tell magnetic people that um no it, it it is very significant a lot of the phenomena that you see uh in Saturnian and jovian systems relate to the magnetic field so it's the interaction of the intrinsic magnetic field of the object with that from the sun produces very complex structures which that it's changing all forces the object is rotating and some of the uh, satellites in their orbit pass in and out of the magnetosphere so all sorts of you know uh, complex goings on and in fact i think um with in the case of saturn um it has its own uh, aurora as well doesn't it you know because of the effect of well both both saturn and jupiter mm -hmm. we 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 observe um aurora on on both yeah quite remarkable isn't it yeah um a couple more questions uh, given the lead time for the missions it must be uh, frustrating to know that by the time your sort of probe uh, arrives or lands, the next generation of sensors have been developed. Um, are these done on a sort of, are these developed on a, a mission by mission sort of bespoke basis, or is there a, a sort of an industry of just general um, sensor development so that, you know, the, the next one's already in the pipeline, as it were? Um, yeah, yes and no. Um... So the, the space agencies, and ESA is the one that I know quite well, um, they have a, a pretty detailed program of technology development, and that is done with a view to which space missions will probably be flying over the next 5, 10, 20 years, um, because you try to be on the cutting edge with with the new mission so yeah there will be detector development often done in industry throughout the world um but, but having said that it, it's it's odd because in some senses what we do we, we take a very conservative approach you, you know obviously you only have one chance at it so in some respects the technology that you fly is actually not necessarily absolutely at the cutting edge you wanted to have some um you know, it wanted to have been proved you don't want to put something up that is unproven technology and you know you spend zillions on this fabulous spacecraft and then the detectors don't work or the cameras don't work or whatever so so yeah there is lots of development but in the end we always use the hottest, latest technology. And just, just to give you a couple of examples, and of course, this is exactly with these very, very long missions. We forget how quickly technology changes. So those images from camera, so somebody tell me how many pixels did that camera have? Just give me a number. Hey, 60,000 pixels, okay? How many, you know, I've got a very crappy old iPhone and megapixels, hasn't it? Um, you know, but we're talking about the design. We Our instruments were selected in 1990, so we did the designs 1990 to 92. Um, and, you know, that was kind of the state of the art then. Um, I mean, having said that, it was a bit challenging because, you know, your your uh, smartphone camera doesn't have to experience the same radiation environment that you do on a space mission, so it couldn't quite fly your mobile phone. But, you know, my point is that that's incredibly old technology, isn't it? Or it seems like old-fashioned technology. And the... Solid state memory. So on on Cassini, make observations with either the instruments on Cassini or the ones on Huygens. The data would be in solid state memory on board Cassini. 
then it was only every now and again when Cassie would be pointed to send the data with its big fish back to the Earth. And, okay, the capacity of that solid state memory so identical ones, two gigabits. What you get on a crappy five pound isn't that right? Mm. I mean, it's nothing. But again, 1990. So, yeah. and of course, and true with all these planetary missions you know the voyagers were giving data what well, are giving data you know and if, if you were to look at the instruments on voyager they would they would be out of an antique shop but some of them are still 30 40 stuff yeah so i don't know if that answers the question no, it does. Yeah. And I think to your point, you know, was it NASA of, um, or the the, um, the large aerial or uh, antenna in um, in Australia was was recently refurbished and switched back on to uh, start receiving from Voyager again. So uh, that was uh, in yeah. the news recently. Yeah. Yeah. Case in point. I mean, it is. Isn't it that that they're still getting data from from one or two of the instruments? Um, if, uh, could just I... as an aside, just just as an aside, I remember setting as a question for for students years ago. Um, if something like, were to use the energy that's coming from one of these deep space probes, you know that we, you know, like Voyager or Cassini, if you were to take that energy that sends the data back and you to use that to heat a kettle how long would it take for the kettle to boil <laughs> and the answer is long the age of the universe <laughs> in other words the energy received you know is so staggeringly tiny you know if you were just to <laughs> use that for something that we could understand it would take you a long time uh right, go ahead yeah i mean just time for one perhaps one more question um uh though those amazing photos of uh through the clouds of titan and and, and on on the surface um you mentioned the smooth uh pebbles or the boulders um what 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 would have smoothed those pebbles or the bowl boulders would it have been methane you know liquid methane flowing across and causing those deltas and so on Pebbles here, by the way. And if can you see it? <laughs> yep. I have, to be, I have to be very careful because I showed this just once, and the story ended up as I think it was OU boffins bring bring back pebbles from Titan or, or from space or something like that. Other hold of the wrong end of the stick. Um, thank God it was only the Milton Keynes season, uh, the times. Or anyway, um, yes, uh, it, it exactly what you say. So um, it, the action of, well, I mean, how do, how do we produce pebbles like this? The earth. It is the action of water. Could be wind, but it's usually, usually water over millennia or a long time. The rock produce this you know lovely smooth surface so that would be the same you know, same there it's just that the real difference so take water and rocks terrestrial rocks and liquid methane liquid methane ethane and chunks of ice you, you will end up with the same smoothing effect um so it that's one of the reasons i think it's fascinating going to places like titan going to the surface of a comet you see the same processes 
but in a very different environment. I mean, things that fascinate, I think it's fascinating about Rosetta, where you see, uh, uh, Comet CG, where you see cliffs and boulders and so on. Um, but this is all happening in an environment where the gravity, strength of gravity, is about one millionth that of Earth. So, you know, we saw boulders should um, move. But, you know, moving a boulder in uh, one millionth of, of G is very different from what it is on Earth. So, you know, very different environment. So I suppose Titan is not so different. It's one seventh gravity, but it's minus 180 degrees uh, centigrade and slightly different materials. John, can I show you? Can you see that? Yep. So, in fact, this should be sitting on the surface on, of Titan. This was a flight penetrometer, which, you know, protruded through the front of the Huygens probe. This, in fact, was the flight version, but in the final testing, we found that it had lost its sensitivity, so we swapped and put in the flight spare. So this, this then became the backup. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> well, John, absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, captured, captive audience, not captured audience. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> great questions and e even, even better answers. Um, and crikey, we're yeah, almost at questions. Seven. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're almost at the uh, uh at, at the time, so I'm going to unmute everybody, and hopefully this will work. But before um before um uh, we say thank you to and again, a little dicky bird tells me that in a couple of days' time it's your birthday. So um, perhaps we can give John an extra round of applause uh, to wish him a happy birthday as well. <laughs> okay. All right. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, you're, you're, you're very welcome and really appreciate you um, uh, taking the time out from your, your schedule to, uh, um, to give us your talk. Um, I just want to round off. All... I'm mostly retired now, so. Uh... <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Okay. Good. Good luck to everybody. Stay safe, and um, you know, I hope everybody survives the lockdown. And uh, forward to meeting in in more normal times. Uh, yeah. We'll have to. We'll have to make that. We'll have to make that work, John. And uh, when we do have an in-person meeting and a. Uh, another open day uh, you know perhaps we can arrange something for then because i think yeah. uh, very special guest and and really appreciate it thanks john thank you so much. thanks for your time cheerio everybody bye bye good now bye bye <laughs> just before we um close the meeting um uh can i just remind people of a couple of other uh, items that are coming up in a couple of weeks time uh, nick who's uh, who joined us today uh, nick schmanick uh, will be our uh, speaker um i think we all know nick and uh, you're going to be talking to us about uh, adventures with ccds mm -hmm. so uh, and uh, giving us some uh, some of your great images i think from some of your remote uh, uh, work um as well so look look forward to that um and i think also um liz sent a message out to everybody about the photographic uh, competition that we're running um in in november so for those of you with um photographs that you would like to to enter i think uh it's free to enter for uh paid up members uh, and a small, uh, a, a small notional fee for other, other, um, say, online members and, and, and guests uh, that aren't fully paid up. And there is a chance to win a, a monetary uh, 
a prize there and a trophy. And um, I think this will be the first of an annual annual competition. Uh, Nick, uh, sorry, mate, I won't be accepting yours. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> No talk there. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think um, I think that's it. Um, oh, and then in December we have um, we have our quiz uh, that Peter and uh, Magda have been working on. So look forward to to that. And I, I'm guessing that you may be asking us some of the questions uh, that perhaps we've been posing John tonight and uh, <laughs> or, or other speakers. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, uh, thanks everybody for attending, taking time out. Um, stay safe as we enter another period of uh, lockdown and um, sort of fingers and everything else crossed that uh, we're all well and we can get back to some form of normality in, um, in the very near future. So I think um, that's it. We can um, close the meeting and um, look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers, everyone. Thanks.